Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for attending our educators workshop on the C3 fame framework for social studies and historical empathy. We are joined tonight and being led by Dr. Catherine Parada, who is assistant professor of middle grades and secondary education at Mercer University Tift College of Education. We are also joined by Maya, who is our ASL interpreter, and you will see her on the screen throughout tonight's presentation. So again, thank you so much for joining us. And with that, Dr. Parada, I hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you everybody for joining us tonight. And as Emma said, I am an assistant professor of middle and secondary education um, with Mercer University here in Atlanta. Um, but prior to my life teaching, undergraduates and graduate students who are aspiring educators, specifically social studies teachers. Um, I was a middle school uh, social studies teacher in New York City. And I mentioned that because it is that experience that really led me down a path of learning not only about historical empathy, but particularly looking at the case of Elizabeth Jennings. And so I'm really glad that you're here and I can share that journey with you and to hopefully leave you some tips and strategies on how you can implement historical empathy strategies and the C3 framework with your students um, about women's history and pretty much anything that deserves critical and historical analysis from our students. So I'm going to share my screen. And throughout the evening, you'll hear, you'll receive some pop-up polls and quizzes just to give us a little bit of information about what teachers like yourselves from the from around the world, thank you for joining us from London, um, need and would like to receive from the museum. Um, I just need um, enabling to share my screen, please. And while we're doing that in the chat, please share not only where you're from, but also feel free to share what you think you know and would like to know about historical empathy. So again, in the chat, if you would like to please share a little bit about where you are joining us from, but then also what you would, what you think historical empathy is and what you would like to learn. And if you'd like to share what you're teaching as well, that would be really great. So we'll give everybody a couple of seconds to do that. Awesome. I think you, Cheryl, you probably know more than you are that you're giving yourself credit for, but you're in the right place if you're looking to learn about what historical empathy is. Thank you for coming. Glad you're here, Donna. Thank you. And so while those responses come in, let's talk a little bit about what is this historical empathy and what you can do with it. I'm coming from a lens from teaching social studies in history education, but I think historical empathy has a place in any of our social sciences that we may be teaching in formal settings, as well as what we teach in informal settings, such as museums, historical societies, and other cultural institutions. Historical empathy, the formal definition, refers to the cognitive and emotive process of identifying historical contexts, being able to recognize perspectives of people's views from the past, being able to explain the difference between the past and present in order to analyze why something in the past holds historical significance, in order to make reasoned, effective connections to content. In other words, these may be strategies you already do in your professional practice. When we are teaching social studies and teaching history, 
we engage students in analysis of multiple sources, particularly secondary sources that lays the foundation and background information about the socioeconomic and political contexts in which people in the past lived. Then we use primary sources to give students and learners a chance to not only recognize that people in the past held different views about various issues, but also to try to begin taking that perspective of somebody else. Maybe not through direct experience, but being able to understand why somebody may have believed or did the things they did. And with historical empathy, while histo identifying historical contexts and engaging in perspective recognition are very cognitive, they're very academic skills that you probably follow with your standards and the C3 framework, which we'll talk about moment in a moment. The the effective or emotive aspect of historical empathy is what makes this um, a very unique and specific strategy that we're not encouraging students simply to just learn social studies and history on its own terms or from an objective or a positivist perspective, but that there were multiple experiences and voices um, and people who lived in the past who had different opinions and views and experiences and how we can make connections to how that makes us feel. Again, whether it be related to a experience that one has or prior knowledge of a topic or vicarious experiences and knowledge of what others have, have gone through. Um, this is what makes historical empathy so powerful when we are purposeful in using sources with students to not only be able to engage in the curricular skills of historical research and inquiry, but giving credence to the importance of how that makes us feel and how using that information can help students take informed action in the present. We can't go back in time and save or help people in the past. But the goal is to have students think about how all of this information and their feelings about this information can inspire them to engage in civic action in their communities. And this can be done in a multitude of ways, not only through, I think, some common ideas of like writing a petition or signing a petition or voting, but even just doing the act of researching history and being open to listening to people in the contemporary world about their experiences and perspectives, which can center counter narratives of marginalized and oppressed people and groups. So in a nutshell, this is historical empathy summarized. And feel free if you want to give a reaction um, as to whether or not these are some or all of these are things that you've probably already done with your students or in your classrooms. Um, to also highlight, historical empathy does not simply refer to just imagine what it was like in the past. It doesn't simply mean to pretend to walk in someone else's shoes. We want students to be able to empathize and understand different perspectives based on their research in primary and secondary sources. With that, it's also really imperative that we are aware that empathy is not sympathy. We're feeling sorry for people in the past or condoning bad actions in the past. That while we engage students in discussion of how the past and present are different, there are some universal actions from the past that can be and should be condemned now. And so again, this is not sympathy or having, you know, if you've seen some of those news reports of teachers who had students simulating some problematic situations, 
um, regarding to race, gender, ethnicity, religion. That's historical empathy that just didn't quite hit the mark. What we're talking about here is understanding why some people believed in bad things, but not but then using evidence to support why those beliefs were um, condemned and should still be condemned today. So we are all here tonight from different corners of not only the country, but friends over in um, Europe. And, and actually, those of you who are joining us from the UK may be very familiar with historical empathy because while in the United States, it's very much an implied curricular skill in our standards, it's very explicit over in Europe. It's very, it's been especially very explicit in the United Kingdom, particularly after World War II. And in a lot of countries rebuilding after the war and the decolonization movements at the time of the 40s, 50s, and 60s to help students to learn about different perspectives and experiences from colonized folks, but also to help, if you will, with the process of denazification in Nazi occupied lands. For us here in the US, it's heavily implied historical empathy of identifying historical contexts, recognizing different perspectives and making effective connections to this studied content um, are included in the four dimensions of the National Council for Social Studies College, Career, and Civic Life Framework. You really got to look deep. If you do a simple search or content analysis of historical empathy, um, the word empathy comes up twice in this document. But if you really look at the standards and what they are asking us to engage students in doing, the process of historical empathy is all throughout this framework in which we can support students in identifying historical contexts, recognizing and taking the perspective of others in order to make reasoned, effective connections to content through staging inquiries by asking compelling questions. So setting the stage for when you're about to teach something from a historical empathy perspective in a broad question that can elicit many different student responses, but also responses that can evolve and change throughout your teaching of a particular unit or a particular topic. Dimension two of the C3 framework um, are the standards connections, which are included in this document. So here in the United States, all 50 states have their own unique standards for grade levels and subject areas. So what we teach here in Georgia in eighth grade is Georgia history, which is different from in DC or in Maryland or New York, California, et cetera. But even though the content might be different, the skills tend to be very similar. And the C3 framework is a universal, if you will, set of curricular standards and skills that students in elementary grades, middle grades, and secondary grades can be able to um, become proficient in. So very much along with supporting the common core. So not to go sideways on that topic, but um, the C3 framework has been around for 10 years and um, has, been a, has been a good scaffold for teachers to make sense of the common core, which many of you probably know, don't have specific standards for history, they are rather embedded into English language arts. So the four, um, and the standards connect to the four major core content areas in social studies. So you would have to be a little, be a little creative in terms of connecting standards if you're teaching like psychology or sociology in maybe the secondary grades, but nonetheless, you would make connections to these 
curricular standards, the skills related to historical empathy, and then having students practice and apply what they're learning through um, engaging in these skills um, of identifying historical context, taking on perspectives of others, and making effective connections to content through the evaluation of primary and secondary source evidence. So it's got to come from somewhere. So we can't have students just imagining what it was like in the past. Students have to base that imagination in the evidence that they are analyzing from primary and secondary sources. The last dimension of this framework involves having students to draw and communicate conclusions based on what they learned, but also to ask questions, maybe go back to answering the compelling question, but taking informed action. So making social studies and teaching our core content areas more than a passive subject where students sit, and in a lot of cases still expect teacher lecture, student takes notes and memorizes facts and dates. Now, with, the, with this framework, it compels teachers and students to think about how they can use this information that they're learning to do something with it in their community. And that could be broadly defined in the classroom, in the school, in the home, or even on a more macro scale. This is a handout that I believe was sent out and we can always send this again. Um, I made a side-by-side -side comparison of the C3 framework and breaking down each of these four dimensions with how they can, how the C3 can be implemented when planning instruction from a historical empathy uh, perspective. When starting, and I'm gonna and we, and I'll share you I'll share with you um, some examples as well. But typically, starting with a broad, compelling question to activate prior knowledge. Um, also, asking students to brainstorm on a big idea. What is a theme, a concept, an idea that? relates to not only the topic of study, but perhaps something that is relevant in their lives. And I'll share that with you in the sample lesson plans in a moment. Our content connections, again, is where we make those standards connections. I recommend the C3 because again, they are more universal to wherever you are teaching. Um, but if you're going to be teaching specific historical content, this is where you could tie in your unique state standards. Dimension three, so evaluating secondary sources to help students build that foundation of the historical contexts of the past, so socioeconomic, political climates of times of study, and then continuing into um, analyzing multiple primary sources of those firsthand experiences of people who lived through certain historical time periods rounding out a lesson or a whole instructional unit, however you would um, conceive of implementing these strategies, having students engage in some sort of, could be a formative assessment, so, or a summative assessment that might be a little bit more high stakes, but a place where students can concretely demonstrate what they learned through their primary and secondary source analysis. Mm -hmm answering compelling questions, discussing, deliberating, debating big ideas to explain, again, how past and present differ, and also communicating why a historical time period bears contemporary significance. Taking informed action is where students can discuss their, their personal experiences their emotive responses to what they learned. And again, just a place and a space for students to really think about what they can actually do with this information to make it relevant to their own lives. Um, I've heard it many times throughout my career, why do I need to know this? And fortunately, not that we need a C3 framework to give teachers permission to do this, but 
I think it at least highlights that there is a place for student engagement in taking informed action within the standards and in the many constraints that a lot of us do face when teaching in the classroom. So the case study tonight in which I started teaching about his from a historical empathy perspective relates to the biography of Elizabeth Jennings. And she's a fascinating person. And the beginning of this um, workshop, I mentioned that I was a social studies teacher in New York City, and I stumbled upon her during my second year of teaching where I went to a PD at the Museum of the City of New York, and they gave us these books. And it was a photo book of um, tenement life on the Lower East Side. And in one of the captions read about how Elizabeth Jennings achieved a major milestone in racial progress in New York City. I had no idea who she was. I also grew up in New York City. So this was really surprising because I never heard of her as a student and then as a teacher. And so as I began to research about her, she was, again, truly a really fascinating figure. She was born in 1827, the year that slavery was abolished in New York State. She was the daughter of prominent abolitionists and advocates of Black education. Her father, Thomas Jennings, um, was a veteran of the War of 1812. He was a business owner. He held a patent for um a method for dry cleaning and was very um, involved in the free community in New York City and in abolitionist circles. Her mother, Elizabeth Jennings Sr., was very involved in literary groups in New York City of Black women and their daughters who would meet in like these third spaces to read, to write, and also to discuss pressing matters of the day. She taught Elizabeth Jennings, the daughter, taught in the colored schools of the New York City Board of Education. She actually, as a child with her siblings, attended the African Free School, which eventually becomes part of the New York City Board of Education. Um, these were segregated schools at the time and eventually earns her teaching certificate and then works in the Board of Education. And so she does this, and in 1854, she was also an avid churchgoer. The church played a very strong role in the Black Freedom Movement, in the abolitionist movement, in the antebellum era. She was heading to church on a Sunday morning in July of 1854. She went to board a horse-drawn streetcar, and she was physically ejected from the streetcar because she tried to board a trolley that was reserved for white folks. And at the time in New York, um, even though slavery had been abolished, it was, it was more of like a de facto segregation where these streetcar companies, which were privately owned at the time, could set their own rules as to whether or not um, their modes of transit can be integrated or not. So she happens to try to get on this particular trolley and um, she was told no, she resisted, she's physically assaulted, ejected from the trolley. And she tells her father, tells her family, who then tells their church congregation, who then raises funds to hire a lawyer, um, the law firm of Culver, Parker and Arthur, to sue the Third Avenue Railway Company for violation of Elizabeth Jennings common carrier rights. And basically what that meant was that if a paying customer was not causing a disturbance on a mode of transportation, so a trolley, a boat, they had a right to ride. And Elizabeth Jennings lawyer who argued her case in New York Supreme Court in 1855 was Chester Arthur, who eventually becomes a president and she wins. The jury sides with her and she wins. And this really was a milestone in civil rights history in New York City. But desegregation of these private streetcar lines happened, but then slowly came back into effect during the Civil War. And for the rest of Elizabeth Jennings' life, 
she continues to teach, she continues to be an activist and a supporter of the of abolition and the education of black children um, through her work again as a teacher and through her church. Um, she survives the New York City draft riots in 1863. She did marry. She had an, a child who died in infancy. She eventually goes on to be a co-founder of the first black kindergarten in her home. Um, I, I want to say it was on the West side. I'm, it, I'm blanking for a minute there, but it was in her house and she, um, and it had a library and the kids played in the yard. Um, and so she was very involved in black education until she passed away in 1901. She's buried in Cypress Hill Cemetery um, out in Queens in the family plot with her husband, her parents and various extended family members. So this was really interesting to me as a student, as a New Yorker, as a historian, as a teacher. Um, there, at the time when I started researching Elizabeth Jennings, there wasn't a lot written about her. And even now, as more things have been written about her, which I'll share some of those resources in a moment, the primary sources by and about her are scant. Um, they just haven't been uncovered. They could have been destroyed in fires or just through the passage of time. And so I started thinking, well, what could we do with what we have about her? And particularly, how can focus and teaching about someone who's underrepresented in the narrative of US history engage students in historical empathy? So when I started this study back in 2016, a lot of the research was focused on famous people and famous events. And my question was, well, can students demonstrate historical empathy if they're studying somebody who's not famous? And I was glad to, I'm glad to report that they can. Um, and so this sample learning activity strategy that is aligned to the C3 framework um, was published in Social Education last year. So if you're a member of NCSS, you have access to this article. And if you're not, we're happy, I'm happy to share it with you. Um, so this was like a long time coming and I finally was able to get it out there for others to use and to hopefully inspire other teachers to use this strategy and this approach when teaching about other significant figures in their communities throughout the country. So I'm gonna just talk through a little bit about what these excerpts are, and I'll point out to where they connect to the C3 framework. I'm coming at this from a historical empathy perspective, meaning how can I engage students in that process of identifying historical contexts, being able to recognize and take the perspectives of others in order to make effective and reasoned emotive connections to content. So this can be done as a, you know, it could be if you did the whole thing, maybe over the course of five days. If you don't have five days, even paring it down to a one day or a two day lesson or a project or problem-based activity would work as well. I started with the big idea of equality. And I asked students, and the first time I taught this it was with groups of middle school students and high school students. And I asked them, is it ever okay to break a rule or a law? And had students brainstorm about definitions of civil rights, brainstorming definitions of what equality meant to them, asking students, can ordinary citizens play a role in civil rights movements? And then just going into discussion and then introducing this particular figure, Elizabeth Jennings, um, as a way to activate students' prior knowledge. So here would be an example of starting a historical empathy um, a historical empathy strategy with dimension one of the C3 framework. 
these are examples of some of the standards that are in the dimension two of the C3 framework that I based this lesson and these learning activities from. Um, again, these are skills, they're not content. So again, it, depending on where you were living and where you're teaching, um, these standards should align to the skills that you're also teaching. And in this case, I shared the um, civics and history standards for grades nine to 12. Um, so having students explain how the US constitution establishes the system of government and that how it has limits has changed over time, um, have, how citizens and institutions address problems, and then having students engage in analyzing um, various um, complex issues um, to understand the perspectives of different of people during historical eras and how this analysis shapes our understanding of the past. The next step would be then segueing into dimension three of the C3 framework. And I like to split that up into secondary source analysis and then primary source analysis. I prefer to start with secondary sources in order to give students a foundation of how to build on their prior knowledge about a particular time in the past. And depending upon where you're teaching or when students have gotten certain um, content in their social studies careers in elementary, middle, or high school, um, they may or may not have a lot of specific prior knowledge about the antebellum period. And coming from my experiences teaching in an urban area in the North, um, it was it's still very much like students believe there was a civil war. The North was free. The South had slaves. The North won. The South lost. The end. And of course, this story about Elizabeth Jennings really highlights how complex the antebellum period was, particularly in the North, with de facto segregation, with the views of people and prominent figures, particularly in New York, who believed in the endurance of the institution of slavery. So I start with secondary source analysis to help students build that foundation of their historical context, but also to help clarify and even push back on misconceptions that they might have about a particular time period. And so I created a sample graphic organizer for students to take notes on the main ideas except in point of view of authors and the and the audience that these sources are directed to about Elizabeth Jennings. And some of those sources includes, um, and again, it depends on what grade level you're teaching, but um, there's an article in Highlights Magazine about Elizabeth Jennings and her court case, Beth Anderson's book, um, Lizzie Demands a Seat. Also, um, if you have some um, more advanced readers, like in upper high school, Jerry McArenda's book, American, America's First Freedom Writer, is a pretty comprehensive biography of Elizabeth Jennings and Chester Arthur. And so students can start here with examining the historical context from secondary sources. And then I give some questions, like reflective questions, tying back to the big idea and tying back to the compelling question in order to keep students still motivated and engaged in that historical empathy piece. But how this make you feel? What do you think about this? How might this be something important that we need to know about today? And here's just some of the covers of those um, secondary sources that I had mentioned in the previous slide. Um, again, the highlights um, article, and this, it's more of a picture book. Lizzie demands a seat would be for elementary students. Um, Amy Hearth's book is probably more for middle school readers. And again, Jerry McGaranda's book would be more for upper high school students. And once students have a good grasp of con historical context, then we start to look at 
perspectives. And this is where primary source analysis comes into play with dimension three of the C3 framework. And being able to the best that you can present the different perspectives of people who might have witnessed a particular event or lived through a particular event. Um, it's really hard, like I said, with the limitations of primary sources by and about Elizabeth Jennings to find like the perspectives of the streetcar conductor who threw her off of the streetcar um, in order to get, let's say, recollections from those. And they were white men who served on the jury who ruled in her case to get their perspectives. So in this case, I really had to dig, particularly in the newspapers. So the Chronicling America um, database from the Library of Congress was an excellent resource where I was able to find articles that reported on her streetcar ejection. So um, when she told her father in the church community about the ordeal, they published her testimony of what happened and resolutions of what they wanted to happen as a result of this incident in the newspapers. Um, the Brooklyn Library has a wonderful repository and online archive of newspapers. Um, and I was able to find from there um, the court record and the reporting of the case in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. And again, a lot of things in the New York Daily Tribune, which was Horace Greeley's newspaper, um, and as we know, as many of you probably know, he was a pretty ardent abolitionist and also a proponent of westward expansion. So again, same thing. I had the students analyze these um, primary sources in order to um, discuss the point of view of the authors, what were the um, what were the documents about, but having them list similarities and differences between the art um, the sources. Um, did one article report on this differently than another? How did one article report about um, the case or the ejection or any of the perspectives of other people involved? And then having some, um, again, reflection questions that tied back to the big idea, tied back to the compelling question. So thinking about this definition of equality and whether it's ever okay to break a rule or a law. And then to wrap, and so here are just some screenshots of some of these primary sources that you can find on these online databases. Um, some of them are a little hard to read, so some of them are transcribed. Some of them you have to, I had to retype several of these, but nonetheless, they are accessible through the Library of Congress and the Brooklyn Public Library. And then to engage students in communicating conclusions um, in dimension four, I gave some choices or some examples of assessment that teachers can implement to gauge for not only skills, proficiency, content knowledge um, acquisition, but also to gauge evidence of historical empathy. Are students able to explain accurately historical context? Are students able to communicate and understand the various perspectives of people who lived um, in the past? And are they able to synthesize this information to explain historical significance? So here, um, and I did this with the middle and high school kids, students could either write a third person narrative, writing based on the documents and um, the secondary sources, a newspaper article reporting on either Jennings's um, streetcar ejection, her court case, or even the whole story in its totality. The second choice was then a first person narrative. So can you, through using primary and secondary sources, write a first person narrative from the perspective of somebody who lived through or experienced or had a direct connection with this ordeal or with this case. And once that is over, um, having students share what they wrote 
to discuss their findings and um, also having students to reflect on how this made them feel, discussing how past and present may differ, but also talking about ways that students can continue their inquiry of equality. Is it ever okay to break a rule or law through about, um, examination of the Elizabeth Jennings case in order to lead a project or to take on some sort of issue um, in their community? And again, this doesn't have to be huge. Um, it could be anything from having students creating a flyer or an infographic, recording a documentary or um, being able to paint a picture or do some sort of community service or write a letter to an elected official. Um, something that can give students agency to where they can apply what they are learning through not only historical analysis, but again, giving credence to their voice, their experiences, and their perspectives, which in a lot of cases, um, you know, youth voices are don't get a lot of opportunity to be amplified. And from a historical empathy perspective, um, a student voice and perspective is necessary if you are truly going to be implementing these types of strategies. And so if you're thinking like, well, how do I know if a student is demonstrating historical empathy, whether it be through writings or discussion or mind mapping? I developed a rubric that you can use as a guide to help you with at least getting a gauge for is there evidence of these historical empathy responses. Um, it is problematic to assess somebody's empathy. Um, it's a lifelong skill. We know that there are many adults who never develop this skill. But here, this is, um, like I said, a guide for teachers to be able to use to see if there is evidence of students being able to analyze historical contexts in order to explain perspectives from the past, in order to make a reasoned connection to what they feel, to what they're learning. So a student might be at a, a level one or needs improvement. If a student is totally communicating their understandings of the past based on stereotypes or might say like something like, well, that was stupid. Why did people do that back then? Without analyzing primary and secondary sources to, again, get a sense for why something, which may seem stupid today, was the norm in the past and just does not make a relevant connection to the content. An approaching level may be where students are able to use some evidence from primary and secondary sources to make generalizations about the historical context of study. And being able to make some vague connections to um, what they are studying and the perspectives of others in the past. A level three or developing is where you see a little bit more of a sophisticated um, use of primary and secondary sources to explain how historical contexts influence the perspectives of people in the past. And again, you just see a little bit more um, concrete examples of how, all right, well, maybe I never experienced what Elizabeth Jennings did, but I heard on the news about somebody who was, let's say, profiled or treated in an unfair way. A level four would be a proficient. So again, this is elastic and you could use this as any way that fits the needs of your students. Um, students are just able to really get into more detail about how the past and present differ, um, the relationship between context and perspectives. They're able to make even more connections to their effective responses to the content. And then a level five would be where students are able to do all of these things and also be able to communicate really clearly how they can take informed issue about something in the past and do something with it today in the present. These are just some other um, strategies and 
I have them saved as PDFs and we can um, send them along or I can pop them in the chat when this is over. Um, but I came up with some links to some sources that I have used um, not only to create, like to find sources, primary sources for historical empathy inquiries that are designed around the C3 framework, like from the Stanford History Read Like a Historian um, repository, the Library of Congress teaching what primary sources, Docs teaches great, but also some other tech um, resources for formative assessment. I know a lot of you probably are familiar with Kahoot and quizzes and all that stuff, but Flipgrid's are really fun where students can share videos and record their thoughts and reflections, Padlets and like Google Jamboards are great for reflection. Um, and then also um, for some more summative assessments when you really have to get into the nitty gritty of evaluating students for content and skills um, acquisition. Um, there's some really great ideas, again, from the Stanford History Group, the C3 Teachers um, Inquiry Lesson. So if you go to c3teachers.org, and again, they don't pay me to, to promote them, but it's a really great resource for teachers who are looking for other examples and models of how to implement the C3 framework. Um, and of course, with these strategies and resources here in this presentation, this workshop, to also incorporate the historical empathy components of the C3. And um, again, this other um, flyer here with um, suggested sources for if you're looking for resources for Dimension 3. So again, some links to secondary sources. Innenberg Media has some really great documentaries. Um, as well as the digital archives um, that are listed here. If you're not familiar with the Fordham University source book for world history, so for those of you who are teaching global or AP world, that's a great resource of primary sources that span the globe and civilizations that um, you would be teaching. So I hope that would be useful as well. And so as we get to the end of this workshop tonight, um, thank you so much for completing the polls, but also we're going to ask you if you would like to participate in our, in your exit ticket, or in this case, our exit survey about how you as a teacher and how maybe other teachers that you know, um, can implement historical empathy strategies. We'd love to hear more about what you know, what you've learned, how you might be able to apply some of these strategies. And me with um, Mercy University, as well as the educators like Emma Rothberg here tonight from the Women's History Museum, we are conducting a study because we want to learn more about what teachers know and want to learn about historical empathy um, for further study, not only um, for curriculum design, but for future workshops and dissemination. So that link to that survey is in the chat, as well as if you'd like to scan the QR code on your screen. And um, we just would really appreciate um, we not only appreciate you taking the time tonight to come to this workshop, but to hear from you um, on these surveys, and it would be a really great um, help to us um, as we continue to show different ways and approaches that we can teach women's history and hard histories to our students during these really difficult times. So thank you again so much. for Thank you for coming. Um, this is my contact information. So if you would like to email me, feel free. Um, you can follow me on social media. I'm terrible at Twitter, but if you DM me or whatever, I will get back to you. And I've also talked about historical empathy and Elizabeth Jennings in um, these links to these two other podcasts. Um, and this is just some references if you would like some further research on historical empathy as a teaching strategy. And with that, I'm going to stop my share. And thank you so much for coming tonight and listening to my presentation. <laughs>
Yes, I just want to uh, echo, thank you so much, Dr. Parada, for uh, leading us through this wonderful workshop um, and for all of you for joining us tonight and participating um, in the multiple polls and the chat that um, we have had going. Um, so again, we would encourage you, if you have the time and the inclination, uh, to please participate in our survey. We're loving, uh, we'd love to get some more data. Um, from you all. And uh, if you found this interesting, we would love for you once we get the uh, recording live on our website for you to share it with any other educators or those who you think might be interested in the topic of historical empathy. Um, so with that, um, we will stick around for a minute or so if you have um, a question. Um, but otherwise, thank you again so much for joining us, and we hope you enjoy your evening. There will be a quick survey that should pop up when you leave uh, this Zoom asking you three very simple questions just so uh, we can learn a little bit more about the audience. Um, but otherwise, again, thank you for joining us and have a good night.